in something. This is important. Go to uh, Hebrews. Thank you very much. Hebrews this morning. And uh, want to, uh, uh, I guess, pick up where we left off. And there definitely is a lot of questions surrounding uh, uh, the book of Hebrews. Uh, let me put it to you this way. Um, if anybody ever wants to convince you that you can lose your salvation, they're probably going to go to Matthew, Mark, or Luke. Uh, they may go to Acts. They may go to Hebrews. And the reason for that is the Gospels, we talked about this before. I want to just, again, I want to I get it to where it's ingrained in your mind, all right? And hopefully more so in your heart. But those, the Gospels are transitioning from the Old Testament to the ministry and life of Jesus Christ, all right? You have a lot of things in the Gospels uh, that you can apply practically, but some of those things do not apply doctrinally. All right, uh, and uh, let me give you an example, okay? Go to, go to Matthew 25 uh, this morning, Matthew chapter 25. Matthew 25, and uh, the, the key to understanding a lot of what you read in the Gospels and, and where, uh, why you can't always necessarily apply everything in the Gospels doctrinally, the key to that is understanding the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. Now, for those of you that have been around for a while, it may be redundant. You may get tired of hearing it. Uh, for those of you that are newer, I'm going to just go over this real quickly. The kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. All right? Uh, Romans 14 uh, talks about being uh, a, 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 a life and joy and peace in the Holy Ghost. That is a spiritual kingdom. All right? Uh, the Bible says that the kingdom of God is within you in the Gospel of Luke. All right? That is a spiritual kingdom. Think about this. John chapter 3, except a man be born again, he cannot see what? The kingdom of God, not the kingdom of heaven. It is a spiritual kingdom. You enter that kingdom by way of a spiritual birth. All right? That said, the kingdom of heaven is a physical kingdom with Jesus Christ reigning on the earth. That's what we call the millennium. It's where he comes back to establish his kingdom on this earth on a physical throne in a city called Jerusalem. Real place, right? All right? So here's what you have to understand. When Jesus Christ is here, both kingdoms are being offered. All right? When he's here, both kingdoms are present. You can't have... All right, the, the king of the Jews without having the, the king of kings and the Lord of glory. All right? All right, you can't have the physical without the spiritual. You have both. The problem is this. When a nation, a physical nation, rejected their king, their Messiah, the physical kingdom went with him. All right, that's where he went. He went up to glory, and that physical kingdom will not come down. All right, won't come down through the efforts of the church. It's not going to come down through the efforts of politics. It's not going to come down until Jesus Christ physically comes back to this earth to, this earth to establish that kingdom. You've got to get that. All right? So in the Gospels, there's a transition where the Lord is still dealing with, primarily with the nation of Israel, and there's those, those things that are uh, referenced to, uh, in, in light of the kingdom of heaven. All right? Uh, in Acts, you're transitioning from Israel to the church. All right? Hebrews, all right, what you're dealing with is you're transitioning from things that apply to the church to things that apply during the time of the tribulation. All right? So I want, I want to give you an understanding, uh, give you a good example. Before we go to Hebrews, look at Matthew 25. Matthew 25. And I want to point out something to you. Uh, Matthew 25. Now let me ask you a very simple question. Uh, how many of you believe that you can lose your salvation? Anybody? Hopefully not. Okay, good, good. I, wasn't, I was not trying to trick you or anything. All right, you don't think you lose That's good. All right, now I'm going to show you that if you believe that, now let me ask you a question. Being that you are saved, are you not a servant of Jesus Christ? Okay, so you're a servant of Jesus Christ because you're saved. You are bought with a price, the precious blood of, of, of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So you're a servant of God. Amen? All right? Whether you live like it every day, whether I live like it every day is another matter. But we are servants of Jesus Christ. All right? By way of coming into uh, a, a relationship with God through salvation. All right? That said, look at Matthew 25, and I want to show you something. And before you read this, do you know any saved people who are not doing everything they can with what God's given them? Might you be one of them? I'll put myself in that category. Okay. All right. So, so basically, there are things that God has entrusted us with. Maybe it's money. Maybe it's our family. Maybe it's our job. Whatever. And those things that he's entrusted us with, we're not, we don't always use them to the fullest of our ability for him. Is that, is that fair to say? Okay. Uh, Matthew 25, I want you to see something here. Matthew 25, and I want you to look, if you would, at verse number, uh, let's see here, verse 14. And underline this phrase, for the kingdom of heaven. Notice it's not the kingdom of God. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. 
Now let me tell you what most Christians, most saved people do with this passage. They end up looking at this going, okay, this is Jesus Christ. He dies. He goes back to heaven on a far journey, right? We are his servants, and he delivered unto us his goods, all right? Here's the problem if you stick to that line of thinking. Look, if you would, at the end, uh, look at verse number, uh, oh, let's see here, verse number 29, Matthew 25, verse 29. Now, let me give you some information about what happens between those verses, okay? The Lord gives uh, one servant one talent, one servant two talents, the other servant five talents, and the one that has the one talent doesn't do anything with it. He just sticks it in the earth and does nothing with it at all. He does not use it for the Lord, all right? Now, at the end, when the Lord comes back to deal, with his serv- to deal with these servants, look what happens with the servant that didn't do right with what God gave him. Look at verse 29. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. If you read this like, okay, this is us, and the Lord gave us certain talents, and we're going to use them, and if we don't use them right, when he comes back in the rapture, and we get thrown into hell because we didn't do right, that's that's how some people interpret that. Here's the problem, all right? The problem is this is the kingdom of heaven parable, all right? I want you to notice that in this parable, because it's a kingdom of heaven where the Lord comes back to physically establish his kingdom on the earth. Now, let me stop you real, real quick in this line of thinking. When he comes to do that, who comes with him? The church, Revelation chapter 19. All right, so this can't be us. We come back with him to help him establish the kingdom on this earth. All right, this is someone else that's on the earth during the time of tribulation. After that time of tribulation, he comes back, and there are those people who during that time of tribulation didn't do right. They did something wrong with what God gave them. Or you could also, if you study the Bible, find out in the book of Revelation if they take the mark of the beast that the Bible says that they go to hell. Now, that's different. This is why rightly dividing the Bible is important. Because if you don't rightly divide the Bible, you'll be so confused about doctrine. And you'll think, oh, man, could I lose my salvation? Well, if you don't read the context of something, then, yeah, you can't, okay? Now, in light of that, look at uh, uh, Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. And notice that in Matthew 25... In Matthew chapter 25, that the Lord delivered unto his servants, what, what unit was mentioned? Talents. Talents. Now, we use that as preachers to talk about like, oh, the Lord gave you the talent of singing or whatever, right? That's a practical application, but that is not what it's talking about. It's talking about a weight of, of gold or silver. A talent is a Jewish measurement. We don't use the term talent for any kind of measurement, right? I mean, we have a hard enough time with kilometers as Americans. Amen? All right? Uh, I like miles. I like feet. You know, that kind of thing. Uh, Look at Luke chapter 19. Let me show you something, though. Uh, Look at Luke 19, and look, if you would, at, oh, let's see here, verse number uh, 11. And as they heard these things, he added in the speak a parable because he was nigh to Jerusalem. This is before his death. And because they thought that the kingdom of God, notice that, underline it, should immediately appear. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So now we're going to switch gears a little bit here. In Matthew 25, he mentions the kingdom of heaven and its talents that are delivered to the servants. Here is the kingdom of God, a spiritual kingdom. And look what he says in verse 13. He called his ten servants and delivered them ten what? Pounds. That is a, a, a Gentile form of measurement. That's what the British, the British pound, okay? All right? And said unto them, occupy till I come. All right? Now, now, let me just tell you, it's a similar type of story. The Lord comes back and finds that this servant, this one servant didn't do right. And I want you to notice what happens with that one servant. Look, if you would, at verse number uh, 24. Verse 24. And he said unto them that stood by, take from him the pound and give it to him that hath ten pounds. And they said unto him, Lord, he hath ten pounds. For I say unto you, that unto every one which hath shall be given. And from him that hath not, even that he hath shall be taken away from him. Similarly to that which you read in, uh, in Matthew. Verse 27, But those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. Now, notice that here in this passage, all right, the one that, uh, the one that uh, didn't do right with the, t- with the pound, he doesn't, get, he doesn't get thrown into hell. Matter of fact, what happens is what what he has is taken from him and given to somebody else. 
Now here's the application to a spiritual kingdom. To a, you know what you are? You are a spiritual priesthood. You know that? The Bible says it about you. And we are a spiritual body. And we enter that spiritual body by way of a spiritual transaction called the new birth. It's all spiritual for us, right? God did not promise us a, a physical land on this earth, all right? That promise goes to the nation of Israel, all right? So in the spiritual realm, what the Lord says to the Christian is, look, when you're not faithful with what I've given you, I'm going to take what I've given you, and I'm going to give it to somebody else at the judgment seat of Christ who is faithful with that, all right? These are, these are things you have to rightly divide. They're different. In Matthew 25, the wicked servant gets thrown into hell. In Luke chapter 19, he doesn't. He just, his stuff that he was supposed to have is taken from him and given to somebody else. Now, you know what some Christians do? They waste their life on themselves, on their career, etc. They get to the end, and they realize, I wasted it. And then they see a Christian who maybe didn't have everything that they had physically, or who didn't chase the same things, or didn't have the same values. But man, now look at them. They're happy, they're joyful, they're fulfilled. And sometimes there's almost envy there. You know why that is? Because you look at that person and go, man, I should have had that reward. And yeah, you should have, but you squandered it. But those are two separate things, squandering a reward versus losing your salvation. You get the difference, all right? And if you don't write and divide the Bible, you don't get that. Kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, all right? That in, in mind, go to Hebrews chapter number 6. So what I'm getting at is this. If you just try to take everything that's in the New Testament and throw it together in a pot and stir it up and go, okay, it all applies to us. We just have to make it fit. Uh, you end up with either contradictions or you try to say the Bible says something it doesn't say. That's what most independent Baptists do. Most independent Baptists say, oh, we believe the King James Bible from cover to cover. But when they come to passages they don't understand, they go, well, what that word really means is this. And what that really means is this. All right? uh, other denominations, other groups, they're like, well, you know, uh, yeah, it means what it says, so you lost your salvation. Instead of right, dividing the thing. You get what I'm saying? All right, so in Hebrews, go there real quickly. Uh, we're, we're going through the Bible, and we're in Hebrews right now. I want to give you a fine example of why Hebrews is the kind of book where, man, there's, there is some really interesting stuff in there. You'll read about the priesthood of Melchizedek. Uh, you'll read about the, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ uh, being sufficient once for all. Uh, but you'll also read about some really interesting things that uh, really just, uh, boy, they, they don't exactly line up, all right, with, with, with church age doctrine, all right? If you really want to get church doctrine, you know where you go? You go to Paul's writings, all right? He is the, the apostle to the uncircumcision, that's us, the, the Gentiles, all right? Uh, you also understand that the mysteries that were given to the church were given through the apostle Paul. So that's where you go. Now, Hebrews, now here, here's what I'm saying. Listen to me real quickly. Sometimes people go, well, you're saying I shouldn't read these other parts of the Bible. I didn't say that. I believe you read the Bible cover to cover, like any other book you read. What I'm saying is that you learn to rightly divide it, and you don't misapply Scripture, and you don't rest it under your own destruction. All right? Because if we see that it's very clear from Paul's writings, you cannot lose your salvation. All right? Then you come across something that looks obscure in the book of Hebrews. You've got to go, okay, what's going on here? Either the Bible's contradicting, or, you know, maybe I can lose my salvation, again, a contradiction to other parts of the Bible, or somebody else could lose their salvation in a different time. All right? Hebrews chapter number 6. Now, let me show you an example of that. Uh, I hope I don't lose you this morning. Some of you are looking at me like, oh, what are you getting after here? Hebrews chapter number 6. All right? And uh, like I said, many who try to prove that salvation can be lost do so by going to transitional books, Matthew, Acts, Hebrews, all right? Uh, and I want you to see that uh, the reader of Hebrews is a saved Hebrew. If you go to the beginning of the chapter, you'll see that the person that writes Hebrews, now it doesn't say who it is specifically. I believe it could have been the Apostle Paul. It doesn't say, all right? Uh, but it's written specifically to Hebrews, and they're saved people, all right? Uh, and what you'll find out, you look at Hebrews chapter 6, and look, if you would, at verse number, um, verse 4. For it is impossible. Now, let me, before I read this verse, after I read this verse, I want those of you who've ever been shown or have ever heard someone teach that you can lose your salvation, that they taught it from this passage. I'd like to see a raised hand if that's you, okay? Verse 4. For it is impossible for those who are once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance. Seeing they crucified themselves, the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. Now, how many of you have ever from that, okay, I got one, I, and I was there, brother, okay, I got a couple here. All right, there's, th this is a passage, and I want to hit this, because I know this is a passage that people will go to, and I want to make this very clear, all right? 
Uh, there's a couple things to consider. All right, uh, consider again uh, the context of Hebrews. All right, the context of Hebrews is being written in Hebrews. You're not a Hebrew. Okay, that's the first thing. All right. Uh, the, the second thing is this. Um, what you're reading here, look if you would at verse number 7. Verse number 7. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herbs meet for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, and is nigh to cursing, whose end is to be burned. Now, where in the Bible do you ever read about a Christian being referred to as a thorn or a briar? You don't. You do, when you, when you read the passages in the Gospels, in Matthew especially, where it talks about the end of the world being like a harvest, where the Lord comes back to establish His physical kingdom on the earth, it says that He's going he's gonna, to he's gonna bring His sheaves, right? And He's going to put them into the barn, if you will. All right? And then those who are going to be rejected and burned... All right, those thorns and briars will experience that as well. Now, church age Christian, go to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 1. This is what we call Bible study. This is what we call rightly dividing the Word of God. And it's important that you learn to do this because uh, at some point in your life, someone's going to knock on your door, someone's going to come to you, you're going to hear something on the radio, you're going to hear a preacher somewhere uh, mention Hebrews chapter number 6. And uh, I actually did. I was riding home with my girls from, from somewhere on our road one night this last year. And we were flipping through the AM. I said, this is really fun. I said, we're going to try to find a preacher and see if we can get some good stuff. And so we found a preacher, and it was interesting, to say the least. All right? Um, I won't go into everything that he said, but uh, my girls were going, Dad, that's not right. That, isn't, that doesn't sound right. That doesn't sound right. I said, no, it's not. I said, but why isn't it right? I wanted them to think. I didn't want them to say, well, because you said so, you know? And so we, went, we had some Bible trivia at that moment. All right, but one of the things he did is he went to Hebrews. Without fail, they'll do that. Now, 2 Thessalonians, look if you would at number, uh, chapter number 1 and verse number 7. And to you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Why can you rest in that? Because you're going to be with him. All right, when he comes back to do exactly this, look at verse 8. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. All right, so he's saying to those, those Thessalonians, rest with us. Why is he saying that? Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Go back. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Now imagine, imagine this, imagine uh, uh, the Lord saying, look, I'm going to give you eternal life, you're never going to lose it, no man can pluck you out of my hands, nothing can separate you from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus, Romans chapter 8, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, so on and so forth, except for, uh, you know, smoking. That could send you to hell. Now let me tell you what I've learned about people that believe you can lose your salvation. They never think that they have. Rarely, now, I will, say, I will say never, but rarely. When I've talked to people, I say, well, have you ever lost yours? Well, maybe once. Well, do you have it? I think so. Now, what kind of blessed hope is that, really? If you're constantly in and out, I mean, thank God, you know, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine, or at least I hope he is, right? That's not a blessed assurance at all. Uh, look at uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The reason he tells him in 2 Thessalonians to rest with us is because he has already written the Thessalonians, and he's already let them know in his first letter, look, what you're looking for is the rapture of the church. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, look at verse number uh, 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. That's physical body sleep, not the soul. That you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which, Jesus, which sleep in Jesus, will God bring with him. That's a promise. All right? And then notice here, uh, verse uh, 17, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. It is not a great comfort to me, if I'm thinking to myself, did I have, do I have salvation? Do I not? Uh, am, I gonna, am I doing right right now? Is he going to leave me behind? There's no comfort in that. 
Now in chapter 5, he switches gears. In chapter 5, he talks about the second coming, where he comes to establish his kingdom. That's why he says, look at chapter 5, all right, verse 1, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, that's the world, peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Not us. He's not talking about, oh, we might not make it, we're not so sure. All right, uh, who is he talking to? Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Paul, verse 1, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians. All right, so again, you're seeing he's writing to save people. And when he writes to save people in the church, he tells them, hey, rest with us. All right, you are sealed until the day of redemption. Amen? Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 30. All right, you don't have to worry about this. All right, now, it is not a license to sin. It's not a license to go out and live wickedly. But the point is this. You are sealed until that day. And you should rest in that. You should not wander back and forth. Am I saying, am I not? All right? The world is the one. The, the, the world, the, the souls that are here, which is why we've got to be burdened to reach people with the gospel. Those that are left behind once we're taken out of here, those are the ones we ought to be concerned about. Amen? Because they're the ones that sudden destruction is going to come upon them, the Bible says. All right? And that's when the Lord comes back to establish his kingdom. So that said, go back to Hebrews chapter number 6. Hebrews 6. And I want you to see that uh, the context of Hebrews chapter 6 is the second coming, not the rapture, where Jesus comes to establish his kingdom, because there's that reference of the harvest of the earth. Revelation uh, 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 17 also speaks to that. You read about that from Revelation 17 through Revelation chapter 19. And by the way, we're going to break down Revelation as well here in the next couple of weeks. All right. Um, so again here, look if you would at, uh, oh, let's see here. Verse number uh, 6, if they shall fall away. That, that, that is a very, very important phrase to look at. All right? If they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified themselves, the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. Now, let me ask you this. In reference to your fellowship with Jesus Christ, your fellowship, can you fall away? Yeah. Yes, you can. Right? Understand, this is not talking about fellowship. And the reason you know that is because the context is the harvest of the world, where he comes back to establish his kingdom. It's not fellowship. It's a reference to salvation. All right? And so what you have to understand is, think about this. Uh, Matthew, go to Matthew 24. I know some of you are going, oh, come on, we've got to get past this, but this is important. Uh, Matthew 24. Matthew tw and for those of you that already know this, I ask you to bear with us for... Uh, for a time, because uh, there, this is a, the kind of thing that, as a pastor, you know what I care about? I care about God's people being confident in what God said. Amen. I do not want you going out into the world and feeling like maybe God lied, maybe there's a contradiction, or uh, it looks like I can lose my salvation here, but not here. Why is that the case? Right? Look at Matthew 24, and I want you to look again at verse 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives... The disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, not the rapture, thy coming, how do you know it's not the rapture, look at this, and of the end of the world. That is not a reference to the rapture. The, the world doesn't end at the rapture. You have tribulation that comes after that, right? So this is something that has to do with after we're out of here, guys, we're gone. So understand this, before you even read Matthew 24, you have to know then in Matthew 24, if you try to get church doctrine from Matthew 24, you're already on the wrong playing field, all right? All right, because in Matthew 24, he's not talking to the church. He's talking to Jewish disciples asking about the end of the world. It's not us, all right? Now notice this. Look at verse number 13. But he that shall endure unto the end, look at this, the same shall be saved. Now you know what a lot of people do? A lot of people say, see that? If you don't endure to the end of your life, and you don't live the Christian life all the way to the end, you could lose your salvation. Now, you understand how that could be taken and twisted out of that verse? If you don't look at any of the verses around it, yeah, you can make it teach that. But the problem is this. The problem is, it's a reference to the end of a period of time. How do you know? Because look at verse number 3 again. He's talking about the end of the world. 
All right? Uh, look, if you would, at uh, verse number 8. All these are the beginning of sorrows. All right? Uh, look, if you would, at uh, verse number 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the what come? End. So there's a period of time. We call this period the Great Tribulation. Thank God we are not here for that. Amen. So if you're not here, why would you read Matthew 24 and go, oh man, i got to endure to the end, right? So that's what we call right dividing the Bible. And so in Hebrews 6, what you have is you've got some people that have to endure unto the end. You say, why? Because they're in the tribulation. All right? So go back to Hebrews chapter number 6. Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6, and uh, again, look at verse number 6. If they shall fall away to renew them again under repentance, seeing they crucified themselves, the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. That enduring to the end, all right, that uh, we read about in Matthew 24, is connected with what you're reading about here in Hebrews chapter 6, in falling away. Well, how can somebody fall away in the tribulation? Look back at uh, verse number, uh, let's see here. Uh, where are we at? Where are we at? Ah, I'm losing my place here. There's a reference to drawing back to perdition. All right? And uh, basically that reference, and I'll, I'll have to see where I, I lost it in here somewhere. Uh, but uh, the reference has to do with the fact that uh, the Antichrist is called the sin of perdition. All right? And uh, obviously what happens in the tribulation is you have the, the time of Jacob's trouble, not the church's trouble. Jeremiah 30, verse 7. The time of Jacob's trouble. All right? And God's dealing specifically with the nation of Israel. You know who he's dealing with? With Hebrews. <laughs> all right? And as much as I'd like to say that that book of the Bible is named after coffee, Hebrews, amen? It's not. All right? It's Jews, Hebrews. All right? And so the point is this. The point is they can fall away. There's, there's only one thing I can really think of. That can cause someone to fall away to that extent. All right? Uh, Hebrews, or, or if you would, uh, look if you would at uh, Revelation. Go to the book of Revelation real quickly. Revelation. Revelation chapter number 13. Then we'll look at chapter 14. Now, for some of you, this is maybe a little heavy. Um, hopefully, you're, you're, you're hanging on. Uh, but I want you to see something here. I want you to see that the Bible doesn't contradict. But it is like a, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. And if you take pieces that belong somewhere else and you try to fit them in somewhere else, kids do that all the time. You ever seen your kid do that? They'll take a puzzle piece and they'll start, and I'm, I'm telling my kid, no, no, if you have to smash it in, it doesn't fit there, you know? Just, just put it right there like that. And when you find yourself really trying to just make something fit into where the church is at and it doesn't, you've got to go, okay, this is, this is too hard for a reason. This is not where it fits, okay? So, Revelation chapter 13, look if you would at verse number 14. And deceiveth then, this is the, the ministry of the Antichrist, and he's that term ministry very loosely, all right? This is his time of reigning on the earth. He's also called the son of perdition, okay? Uh, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had do, uh, power to do in the sight of the beast. There's the false prophet and the beast, the Antichrist, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Now, let me stop and just say this. When, when this, I mean, even a hundred years ago, people would read this and go, what is this, some kind of magic? You know what we call it today? YouTube. No, really. How do you, imagine the Apostle John watching a video and seeing this thing happen. And seeing, you know, he's got, they've got power to give life to this thing, and the whole world wonders at it. How does the wor whole world see anything happen at one time? Prior to the 21st century, we would have thought that's insane. It's not going to happen. I mean, in the 90s, we thought CNN and, and you know, the news uh, cable networks. Man, now, anything that happens anywhere, I mean, I was at an air show yesterday. Everyone's doing this, you know. <laughs> You know, think about this, Moses and Elijah being killed and the whole world rejoicing over it. How would the whole world rejoice over it if they couldn't see it? How did they get to see it, man? YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, man, it's instant right there, right? 
And so here you have this thing taking place where this image is, is uh, uh, allowed to speak and it's, it's a dark power, if you will. Look at verse 16, though. This is what I want you to notice. He causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. We call this the mark of the beast. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is six hundred, three score, and six. That's six, six, six. Now here's the thing. In the tribulation, you have to endure unto the end. What's that? Oh, the time. Thank you, sir. Oh, okay. Hebrews 10.39. Uh, well, it actually, oddly enough, is like 1040. So I'm like, oh, okay. It's the first time you've ever mentioned what time it is during church, but all right. Thank you, brother. Appreciate that. Hurry yeah, hurry up. <laughs> Praise the Lord. All right. Uh, you can always rely on Joel to shake things up, you know. So I will go back to Hebrews in a moment here. Thank you, sir. Uh, so uh, here in Revelation chapter 14, notice, look if you would, at verse number Nine And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast, Revelation 49, and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So I'm going to play out a scenario for you, okay? During the tribulation, let's say I, I, want to, I believe on Jesus Christ as my Savior. I, I didn't trust him as my Savior during the time of the church. The church had been raptured out. All this chaos is going on the earth. You have 144,000 uh, Jewish male prophets that are going out and preaching. All right? You've got Moses and Elijah you know, in the tribulation showing up and dying and then coming up from the dead, that would get people's attention, I would think, you know, especially with social media, right? And so all of a sudden you guys, people going, man, I want to receive Christ as my Savior, but here's the problem. I love my kids and I want them to eat. How do I, how do I exist in this tribulation world if I don't take the mark of the beast? The answer is, According to other parts of the book of Revelation, if you refuse that mark, you die by one of two ways, starvation. Now, this is awful stuff. I know this doesn't sound very pretty, guys. That's why you ought to thank God you're born in the time that you're born in, and that you receive Christ as your Savior now. But you either die of starvation, or, according to other parts of the book of Revelation, because you refuse to worship the beast, and you refuse to take that mark off with your head. Now, even that, even 30 years ago, the idea of people watching beheadings he would have said, there's no way the world will ever accept that. You guys seen what's on YouTube now? Yeah. I, I Actually, uh, I, won't, I won't go into the whole story, but someone sent me a link to something, and it was a YouTube video, and it was, it was actually, uh, or it was on Facebook or something, and it was someone praising these beheadings. I did what I could have reported to Facebook and say, look, <laughs> I said, look, if you guys are going to turn Christians off for putting stuff that's, you know, anti-whatever, all right, you guys need to turn this off too. This is junk. But the whole world is getting desensitized to stuff. When you see it every night on the news, so many more beheadings, so many, eventually the whole world is going to go, yep, these are the troublemakers, let's get rid of them, let's have peace on the earth once and for all. Because that's what the Antichrist promises. So, here's the point. For someone to endure unto the end of the tribulation, you know what that means? They can't take the mark. Take the mark and you're done. So what happens in the book of Hebrews is a, a, a Jewish man picks up the Bible in the tribulation. Let me just play out a scenario for you. Picks up the New Testament, he goes, okay, so these prophets are preaching the name of Jesus, and these are Jewish prophets, Moses and Elijah. We don't mistake these guys. We know who they are. All right, when they show up, uh, they have power to cast fire out of their mouths, and they have power to shut the, the heavens that there's no rain in the earth. All right, they have, all, they, they have power to turn water to blood, all that kind of stuff, Moses and Elijah, right? So here they are. they got supernatural powers. They're preaching the name of Jesus Christ. And then you've got 144,000 that are doing the same thing. And so all of a sudden, a Jew gets interested in picking up a New Testament. Where do you think he's going to go? Maybe a book that says Hebrews. Maybe a book that, that concentrates on the Old Testament versus the New Testament priesthood of Jesus Christ. That's where he's going to go. All right? And so when he's reading that, he's reading this stuff, 
And he's reading Hebrews chapter 6. He's talking about falling away. Then he reads the book of Revelation, and he hears these prophets saying, don't take the mark. And he goes, okay, I got it. Now if I take it, it's on me. So that's what's going on. You go, I never heard that before. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry you lived your whole Christian life without hearing that. But you know what most Christians will do? A lot of preachers will take the Bible where it says things like that, and they'll either make a contradiction where there isn't one, by saying you can lose your salvation where the Bible says you can't, or they'll say, well, it doesn't really mean that. Either one is wrong. Take it literally, but rightly divide it. All right? So uh, go to Hebrews chapter number 10 in verse 39. Thank you, Brother Joel. Hebrews chapter 10. It's probably one of my best moments so far. That's good. Hebrews 10, uh, verse number 38. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, where would he draw back to? He would draw back to the mark. He'd draw back to the world, to the false worship that the whole world is going to be uh, undergoing during that time. My soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back into perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. There's a drawing back unto perdition that can happen during the tribulation that, thank God, you cannot even experience in this life if you're saved. Amen? So that's how we rightly divide the Bible. Now, for sake of time, go to James, all right? We're going to at least, at least start this thing off. James. James. And I want you to understand once again that you've got some, uh, uh, doctrinally speaking, you have some things here that apply to the tribulation. Now, here's what we're going to find out. When you had Matthew in, in, the, in the Gospels, you have them transitioning from Old Testament to the life and ministry of Jesus Christ and the kingdom being offered to Israel. The book of Acts, the, the Jews reject that kingdom. The Lord uh, clearly says, okay, I'm giving the gospel to the Gentiles. They'll be saved no differently than the Jews. All right, all through Jesus Christ. Makes it abundantly clear. All right, then you have Romans, and you've got all the letters that are written to the church. Church doctrine. And then you've got Hebrews, and James, and 1st, 2nd Peter, and 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. And you start seeing that the, the tone changes a little bit. All right, uh, James, look at James chapter 1, verse number 1. Now, again, the reason why it's important to get context, who is speaking, uh, what are they saying, what is the message, and who are they speaking to? That is very important to get. Without that, you cannot study the Bible. All right? James chapter 1, look at verse 1. If we're going to learn about James, let's start at the beginning. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. Is that you? No. <laughs> we are not of the twelve tribes of Israel. We are of a spiritual body. You know what the Bible says in Galatians? In Christ there's neither Jew nor Gentile. Let me stop and ask you a question. He also goes on to say this. There's neither male nor female. You're going to tell me there's no difference between you men and you women this morning? Well, in God's eyes, from a spiritual standpoint, your position in Christ, there isn't. But as far as your physical state, you bet there is. Yeah, there is. Sure. I mean, I don't... There's times, you know, my, my poor daughter... You know, she'll cry at the drop of a hat sometimes now, which she didn't before, my oldest one. Yesterday, we're moving something, and she goes, oh, I just don't understand. And I'm like, oh, Lord, what did I do? <laughs> don't tell me you guys were all the same. We're not. But spiritually, in Christ, our position in Him, we're equal. We're equal. There's neither Jew nor Gentile, male nor female. But physically speaking, that is not true. Okay? And so when He says to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, you automatically know this is not written to the church. All right? This is written to the nation of Israel as they are scattered abroad. All right? And that's about all the time we have. I still didn't get to James chapter 2. And uh, uh, comparing that with Romans chapter 4, we'll do that next week. All right? So we'll stop there.